Welcome to Slash Forward. We're almost there, folks. We're going to be looking at Saw 3D, renamed Saw the Last Chapter, even though it's not. Hit the like button if you're ready to get to the traps, and I'll do so right after I unpack the storyline to see what we can learn. Let's get to it. We open, surprisingly, on Dr. Gordon, wriggling his way along and finding a nice steamy pipe with which to cauterize his fresh stump, before flashing to an unknown time and place where the bustle of the big city is brought to a standstill by a curious storefront display. A couple of bros awake, attached to a saw table, with their mutual lover dangling betwixt. Some of the gawkers call the police and one of them bangs on the glass. Otherwise, they don't really do much. Billy the Automaton then pedals out to greet Brad and Brian and Tina, the ruiner of alliteration, letting them know that the boys were played for simps, manipulated to provide for Tina's every whim. So now they have 60 seconds to either push the saws to one side or the other, cutting up a slab of man meat, or leaving it in the middle to bifurcate Tina. Tina tries to charge Brad up with some encouraging words, but Brian absolutely wrecks his car hearts, drawing first blood. But then he has second thoughts, and after an apology, the police run up just in time to see the boys awash in the blood of their sacrifice. We then circle back to the last ending to watch Jill stagger off, trying to avoid Hoffman who is out for blood. He finds a nice clean rag for his mangled hand, but opts to let his face air out a little bit to stave off infection. He soon arrives at his private tool shed to catch some news and sew himself up, and the results are merely noticeable. Then we go back to the station where Jill is looking for help outside the FBI and homicide department. For protection from her various pursuers, she enlists the help of Gibson from internal affairs. She agrees to give him some moisture-rich evidence, but only if he grants her full immunity, which, as we all know, is the purview of the police force. He's a bit incredulous until she drops the hot stuff. He's Detective Mark Hoffman. And he nearly explodes with anticipation. Back at the tool shed, Hoffman makes like he never existed as he prepares for the inevitable fallout, which may include Bobby Dagan, a jigsaw survivor who's written a book about his experiences. He explains to his expectant host how he had to pierce his breasts in order to hoist himself to a platform of salvation. Near death, he recognized his was a life left unexamined and dug deep to find the strength and courage to carry through. In the end, he pretty much slaughtered this TV performance, but his management team disagrees about whether he was exploitative enough of his own trauma. Elsewhere, Jill emerges into the evening fog and finds a strange scene. It seems a bit too set up, and as suspected, she gets grabbed here. You see, Hoffman's got this rocket sled, and it would be terribly disappointing if he had to run before using it. As it screams down the track and quarters her helpless body, we discover this to be a rare dream sequence. In the junkyard district of town, Evan wakes up in his project car which powers on its magical 8-track player. It announces that he and his friends are racists, and since they all follow his lead, it's time for him to lead them all to safety. All he has to do is pull the lever before him. The process of doing so should help him to understand how we're all made of the same stuff on the inside. He makes a go of it, and despite getting three quarters of the way, he gasses out, which results in a tremendous catastrophe. Now that the story's been properly advanced, we meet back up with Bobby, leading a survivor's meeting with cameras in tow. He attempts to help them cope, but is he licensed? We don't know. At any rate, if we're getting a bit tired of hearing him talk about the goodness of suffering, we have Simone joining the chat to call him on his BS. She insists there's no absolution through pain, but Bobby rallies and insists they all must search for the positive to derive some meaning from their experiences. This is mainly for the cameras, and you know who's not impressed? Dr. Gordon. He leaves him with some choice words. However, the final verdict? He crushed it. Again. And when he gets out to his car, he learns he's going to be doing it all over, which is great for his brand. Meanwhile, the cops have discovered the most recent site and call in Gibson to lend his expertise as an IA administrator. The tape is warped from the crash, so they're left to wonder why. But it appears possible this was all just to flex a little on old Gibson here. Bobby then wakes up inside a tumbler and learns it is, again, game time. But actually not. Again, it is game time, but he lied about his previous experience. So now he gets to learn a valuable life lesson. He has 60 minutes to pass some tests and save his wife. The cage is then lifted over a spike platform with a ring hanging above. With no instruction, he immediately pulls the ring, which drops out the bottom. He hangs on tight and Donkey Kongs his way to safety while Joyce gets a little preview of what's to come on the CCTV. He takes a moment to flash back to when he and his bud were just a couple of washed out losers, and a news story of a survivor's travails gave 
gave him the motivation he needed to kick off his self-help empire. Then he heads to the only unlocked door and follows the trail before him. As we catch up with all our various characters, we find that Jill is safe and sound in witness protection, and that Gibson is so upset that she's still holding out on him about some key details. She's concerned about her safety even here. At which Gibson scoffs. I mean, it's a safe house, is it not? But then they get a DVD delivered to them from Hoffman. God damn it. I know, right? Gibson gets an update from Rogers, who has to hang up when a bomb goes off at the yard, so they focus their attention to the DVD, which must have been copied off a of VHS, judging by the tracking bars. In order to stop the ongoing game, they'll have to turn over Jill. Instead, Gibson orders her locked up in a holding cell. When Bobby makes it to his next challenge, he finds his associate strapped down with some menacing pipes pointing at her. It seems that this contraption was devised to help with pulling loose teeth, but he plays the tape just to be sure. The key to her padlock is is inside of her, attached to a hook. If time runs out or if she screams too loud, the pipes will enter her. Naturally, she immediately starts screaming. Nina gets calm again and gives Bobby permission to just go for it. But honestly, that sucker is in there so tight, they didn't really need to have a time limit imposed, cause your girl can't help but to scream. He does get it out with only a little bit of her esophagus attached, but he misses the timer. After he shouts his dissatisfaction into her cold, dead face, we see that failures cause Joyce to get pulled a little closer to the floor. In the next room, he finds a copy of his book that he had previously signed for a teenage John Kramer. John gave him a little guff about his lying ways, which is now really coming home to roost. As the kids say, back at the precinct, Gibson recognizes a lawn cherub from the video, and then they're alerted of some security footage that shows them the abduction, getting them one step closer to the edge. In the next room, Bobby finds his attorney Suzanne pinned to a table. Before he can do much, Kool-Aid Billy smashes his way into the room. He learns that she's on a rotating table that's set to pierce her eyes and mouth unless he's able to lift a set of bars that closes a circuit and slows her table. Ya boy manages to press a full stack like an absolute madman, and even while getting fully stabbed in the ribs. But he's untrained in static contractions, causing him to continuously fail. A necessary step for building mass, but really only delaying the inevitable as regards Suzanne's face, making her death, in a way, much, much worse. Back at the station, Gibson asks Jill about Bobby, but she claims to know nothing of him. When they return, they've received a new video from Hoffman. He drops a little riddle for his old pals, which Gibson immediately picks up on, so they head right out. Bobby then advances again, but not to Joyce. Kale is the next victim, on the other side of a catwalk, and presently freaking the freak out due to a head contraption that prevents him from seeing. Bobby is to guide Kale across, then meet him with the key before the winch engages and cranks on his neck. They make their way across, and Kale nearly denies the winch her prize. Bobby snags the key with 10 seconds to spare, but then tosses it to a blind man, sealing his fate, so Bobby exits stage right. Gibson and Rogers bust in to find the cherub. This is the location where Hoffman saved Gibson as a beat cop. Gibson got jammed up and, while thankful for his life, did not appreciate Hoffman's disdain for the citizenry. Gibson turned him in and has been trying to put him away ever since. The clue trail then points him to an old abandoned psychiatric hospital. He goes to check that out and sends Rogers back to hover over Jill. Meanwhile, Bobby gets to the final room, where he can see and communicate with his baby. He tries to reassure her before Billy cuts in. The door before him has a four-digit code, and he has the numbers etched into his molders. The next steps are obvious, so he gets started as a police tactical unit works to catch up. He makes good time wrenching out his bloody chiclets, and halfway in, they track the video source to the address of the junkyard, so Gibson peels off to finish his unfinished business and is unable to share in Bobby's success as he gets the code and proceeds. The team then pulls on a door that engages a gas trap, taking them out of the equation. While Gibson arrives at the junkyard and finds a secret entrance through which he eventually, presumably, finds Hoffman in his jigsaw robes. Back with Joyce, Bobby's final test is to earn her love by surviving the very game he contrived for his book. He's gonna have to pierce them titties and hoist himself up to connect some extension cords. He comes clean about his deception and apologizes for lying as she admonishes him, even though he's doing the dang thing. At the same time, we learn the man that the chair is actually one of the corpses, and that Hoffman's had eyes on them the whole time. Gibson puts together that, while distracted by the explosion, Hoffman had pulled the old switcheroo with the body so he could get back into the station in the manner of a true mastermind. Gibson tries to call Palmer to have her order everyone back to the station, but he and the boys get squibbed up while Hoffman emerges and slathers his face wounds in fresh blood as he kills his way to the holding cell. When we circle back to Bobby, he's looking fit and moist and getting the job done. 
Luckily, Skin is very easy to puncture. Joyce professes her love for him pursuant to this new sacrifice, and he cranks his chain all the way to the top. He basically makes it, but finds he didn't go deep enough and crashes back to the floor. The timer then counts down, and Joyce is entombed in a brazen hog, which lights up and roasts her alive. Meanwhile, Hoffman lands a perfect eye shot from the observation room. He walks in, thinking he's got the edge, but not realizing that Jill used her time in holding to craft her first shank. She sticks him and runs until she finds a little spot to duck away. Unfortunately, Hoffman finds her and renders her unconscious. He then dusts off the torture chair they keep around and buckles her down. After that, he hooks her up with a classic, sets the timer, and lets it ride. Given the fans the payoff they've been waiting for? Nah, who knows? He then waltzes back to his tool shed to continue escaping. But while he's busy walking away slowly from an explosion, his moment is interrupted by the cult of John Kramer, led by none other than Dr. Gordon. We find he was indebted to Jigsaw for nursing him back to health and caring tenderly for his stump. He's then enlisted to employ his surgical skills skills in the execution of various traps that required it. We learn that in exchange for his help and in acting on his behalf after his death, John agreed to share with him the final secret, the location of his old room that he was so fond of. This is where he leaves Hoffman, but unlike before, he offers no redemption. This was the first film that feels distinctly different from the rest of the series. As we're looking for bigger payoffs, things are getting progressively more silly, and I wonder if they're drifting from the original intent. Is this good or bad from a trap? perspective? Let's take a look and see. We'll start as the movie does with the triple saw situation. Here we have an opening trap to set the tone. Incidentally, it's not connected to any of the other scenarios that unfold throughout the movie, and comes across as contrived merely for shock value. Tone set, let's go! This trap seems to be initiated by magic. What is the timing on it in terms of starting the motor and rolling Billy out and the participants actually waking up? This may seem nitpicky, but it's highly problematic because if magic is involved, I'm gonna have to do a lot more research. The basic gist here is the boys can either fight it out in a reverse tug of war, pushing the saws to one side or the other and obliterating their partner, or they can leave them as is and let Tina get split into two medium-sized portions. They end up with option B, although I'm not sure they had to. It's hard to tell what all is going on with these quick cuts and close shots, but I think there are at least two possible ways to beat this from the inside. Obviously, if some of these bystanders would have gotten off their ass and done something, it may have been a very different outcome. Yeah, a 110 pound lady slapping the flat side of her briefcase against the glass didn't break it, but are we to assume this structure was purpose built? Is this bulletproof glass or just the window glass from a building that already exists? Does the building have doors or employees? Already we're starting off with quite a few absurdities just to bring this thing together, but from inside the fellas are harnessed to the frame by their wrists and hips. Even so, they seem to have a good deal of range of motion, and they don't seem to have to move too terribly far to get that center saw to start dropping significantly. With their saws oriented upward, it seems possible that they could cheat far enough to one side or the other, moving their bodies out of the way of the saw to create a safe environment for all three of them. It can also be confirmed that these are gas-powered tools. The exhaust builds up over the course of the trap, and some still shots reveal that the exhaust ports are unprotected and right on the side. One of the boys could likely put their foot over the end of the exhaust or even rest their face across it or put their mouth on it to choke it out and stop its rotation. It would then be safe to pull the contraption all the way over on the side where the saw is no longer functioning. Next is the junkyard setup. If you were unfortunate to find yourself involved in this trap, you're probably going to wind up dead. But according to the recording, as long as you're not a racist, that would be unlikely to happen. This is another trap designed for death. Yeah, I think we may want to believe we would have the inner strength to be able to do what needs to be done. But this is a a full thickness degloving of Evan's entire torso. Absolutely brutal, and I'm gonna say it, probably not possible. I think it likely you would go into shock before you ever got far enough, even if it was possible to separate this much skin from your back, slowly and through sheer force of will. Nah, in this one, Hoffman needed this to go down. It was integral to the overall plot and initiated all the key requirements of his master plan. If this trap didn't kill, none of the rest of the movie would happen, which is why it's such a ridiculously impossible scenario. Just glancing over it, I do wonder if your skin would actually give way before the upholstery. If you don't want to test it, perhaps there's a sharp enough object lying nearby that would allow you to cut away enough to be able to lean forward to the lever. This then leads me to acknowledge the importance of always carrying a knife on you, a vital survival tool in all situations. But then, it seems likely you would be stripped of useful tools before being put into the setup, which naturally leads to the rule amendment that you should always keister a knife so you have access to a useful and vital tool in all survival situations. 
So to clarify, the newest rule would be to always have a knife, ensured by storing it up your butt. And then we'll move on to Bobby as he dominates the remainder of the traps throughout the movie. Just to set the stage, he's inside a very much uncleared area with 60 minutes to make his way through the various rooms, saving his cohorts along the way until he eventually gets the chance to save his wife. He starts out inside a cylindrical cage that hangs above some spikes. This one has no instructions and no broader message. It's sort of a light warm-up for what's to come, and represents more of a physical challenge than what we normally see. He also escaped it with no problem, so it doesn't warrant much analysis. Realistically, if you were attempting to release yourself, it would behoove you to start by getting your feet wedged into those squares to maintain a solid base. Also, the swinging and jumping aspect would be easier from the very bottom of the cage, rather than several rungs up. But these are minor quibbles. This brings him to Fish Hook Nina, restrained in a straitjacket and tied down in the center of this contraption. First step here is to ignore the key. The fact that there is sound control in this device makes it impossible, and there's enough blood coming out here that she's unlikely to survive anyway. She would probably end up suffocating from the pressure of the blood pooling up around her internal organs. You'd want to focus on trying to stop the machine to give more time to disassemble it and get her out. As an initial point, the timer device has an on-off switch contained directly on its face. From there, it might be worthwhile to find something you could use for leverage, possibly from the prior area, and see if you could pry against the frame of the machine to get the gears to gap just enough so they can't grip. If this process is a bit too noisy, risking the victim's throat, this device has a variety of exposed wiring you could tug on to various effect. Once you've taken care of that aspect, you could keep working on pulling things apart. I see no reason why you wouldn't be able to wrench the padlock off the box or its little metal strap. With the presence of so many cans along the wall here, I also wonder about the presence of a can opener somewhere. It seems like this could be helpful in regards to cutting wires, if needed. So really, there's a lot of options with this one. You just have to look beyond the person and become one with the machine. This then brings us to Suzanne's table. I would have liked to have come into this room to find Suzanne partially free. She really had a lot of arm freedom here, and I feel like it was squandered somewhat. But that's a secondary concern, as there are several simple options elsewhere. Her table is motivated by a simple gear and chain system. These types of chains are adjustable in length, and will typically have a connecting link that allows you to short or lengthen it before closing it off again. Pulling this link out of the chain would completely negate the trap. There are also a couple of options at the actual machine, which was not well thought out. First, the expectation is that he will press the weight upward, but in so doing, it enters his ribcage from the side. How is he supposed to press up while this is going in from the side? This complication is ultimately negated, however, in how the system works. By pressing up on the top, he touches two bars that then close a circuit, slowing the table. If he slows it to the end of the timer, she will survive. Atop this contraption are some clearly visible exposed wires. It seems possible that you could pull these out and attach them in the middle, preventing you from having to press at all. Barring that, you could also put any of a variety of random conductive objects between these two connection points in order to close the circuit, without having to move the bar very much or at all. In particular, there were some warmers or coolers or something near the kitchen that had some metal wire racks in them that could be propped up here. From here, we find ourselves in another challenge that rewards physicality, Kale's winch noose. This challenge seems a bit stretched. The odds of guiding Kale blindly across these boards is so small, and it takes so much time to talk to him. Their best odds would really be for him to stay put and have Bobby just come all the way over. Realistically, this is doable with a bit of agility and some calculated risks. For instance, Bobby tossed him the key at the end rather than hopping over to him. But why not hop? He did it once before, and it seems like there should be some way for Kale to get to where he was so they could exit the door at the end. This trap also puts a lot of emphasis on the downward dangers when it's really upward that's the problem. Kale is going to get hung if you don't get across quickly enough, and the drop is just one floor. Typically, you'd have to fall from higher than four floors to ensure death. So as uncomfortable as it may be, you're really weighing the risk of minor to moderate injury over someone else completely dying. Here, I will also have to invoke the technique previously established by Hoffman of pulling down hard to get out of a head harness. Kale is likely familiar with this type of device, as it seems the sort of thing he would have at home. And if he could get vision, everything would run a lot more smoothly. The final two challenges are fairly straightforward, and since they were designed with the intent of wrapping up the final plot points of the movie, there isn't a lot of detail available for them. The first involves a simple code lock to open a door, and the code is imprinted on Bobby's teeth. 
he did pass this one, and with such limited time and resources available, the option he went with isn't necessarily a bad one. It's not clear exactly how this mechanism is set up, but these types of devices are typically very simple. There are a couple of wires intended to provide power to the keypad, and then a couple of wires that communicate the signal as to whether the circuit is open or closed, in order to engage or disengage the locking mechanism. Would it have been possible to bridge them and open the door? Perhaps. There are wires sticking out on the front here, but at this point, you'd be tired and emotionally exhausted. A little pain might actually perk you back up and give you the drive you need to see this thing through, especially on the heels of so, so many failures. Which finally brings us to dear innocent Joyce, who paid a tremendous price for the transgressions of her husband. Bobby is to hoist himself up to plug in an extension cord via a simple chain and pulley device with two hooks on it. It seems the primary thing slowing him down was the pain of piercing his pecs and pulling himself up by his flesh. So don't use your flesh, bro. Put your belt at approximately nipple height and latch onto that, or leave it on your waist. Or if you don't have a belt on, use the top part of your pants, which can also be rolled over a few times to enlist the help of more fabric, increasing the tensile strength and improving the odds of getting yourself up there. All in all, this whole funhouse of challenges would be an easy one to make it through. You could really fail as much as you'd like and still get to the end, which would then just require you to pull a couple of wisdom teeth, which you were going to have done anyway, and then you're golden. You've got this. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks uncensored movie reviews of Life Force and Under the Skin, with others to be added over time. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.